Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. Um, you know, we develop a really keen understanding of God's Word only by inputting the Word into our heart, just continually. And um, it doesn't really matter, you know, if if it's something that may seem boring. I think if you read it in faith and just say, "I know the Lord that this is what God's." What you are, what you have spoken to me. This is God's word spoken to me, so I'm going to input it into my heart, and then over time you find value in it, you know, and, and God brings it up things that, um, you know, you didn't necessarily make connections before. All of a sudden you start to make connections in the word about these things, and um, it's really quite astounding how God does that. Sorry, I was just checking my mic, make sure it's on. So we are in Second uh, Kings, and we are in Second uh, Kings. Chapter 23, and uh, let me make sure that there's no uh, nothing highlighted out here. I do. I have some highlighted out. I have uh, uh, chapter or verse seven highlighted out, just because that's a certain lifestyle and and um, profession that is uh, you know not friendly to little listening ears. I don't know if we have any of those with us. And then uh, also part of chapter 10 or verse 10. I don't know why I keep saying chapter. It's verse 10. Um, and then I want to make sure that I, I think I do, we do have some stuff highlighted out. And that's actually Jeremiah chapters 1 and 3. And there is uh, Jeremiah. So, Jeremiah, we're in it. Pardon me, nothing in Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 3, I do have quite a bit highlighted out. We've got uh, part of verse 1 highlighted out. Parts of verse 2 highlighted out, part of verse 3 highlighted out, part of verse 6 highlighted out, parts of uh, verse 8 and part of verse 9, and part of verse 13, and that's again has to do with a specific type of lifestyle that um, is not acceptable to God. It um, you know really causes a lot of pain in families. Anyway, um, so here in 2 Kings chapter 23, we are... I taught, we, we were reading about King Josiah, and he was um, the last good king of the southern kingdom. And uh, his reign brought about a mighty revival in the land, a very awesome time. Uh, last episode we read where uh, he, he, they found the book of the law in the temple, and he realized we're not doing everything that God requires. Um, and so uh, God says, I am indeed going to bring disaster on this land because of what the people have done. But then he says, but King Josiah, since you repented, I will make sure that comes to pass after your lifetime. And so now we're going to read where Josiah, Josiah, instead of just saying, okay, well, that's nice, and just continuing just continuing to be a good king, he goes much further than that and really begins to um, uh, turn the hearts of the people back to God. And in order to do that, he has to destroy some things that the people love but are not doing them any good. They're doing them harm. And so uh, verse 1 of chapter 23, it says, then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them from the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. And the king instructed Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second rank, and the temple gatekeepers to remove from the Lord's temple all the articles that were used to worship Baal, Asherah, and all the powers of the heavens. So the parent, so th this is just junk that's been left over, that's been put in the temple, that never had any place there, never had any uh, business being there. And so now because they've discovered the, the book of the law, and Josiah has read all these things. He's like, we've got to get rid of all this junk. And so he's, he's doing an excellent job. It says the king uh, had, this is still verse uh, 4, the king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem on the terraces of the Kidron Valley, and he carried the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests who had been appointed by the previous kings of Judah, for they had offered sacrifices at the pagan shrines throughout Judah, and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. So that so remember, um, 
Hezekiah, his predecessor, had removed all the shrines in the pagan areas. And uh, then after his reign, his son put it all back. And then his grandson put it all back again. <laughs> you know, and so now Josiah is removing it again. He's like, we're, we're, we're done with this. This is all nonsense. Uh, uh, awesome. Uh, this is still verse... Let's see, I, think, I guess we're still in verse 5. Yeah. They had also offered sacrifices to Baal and to the sun, the moon, and the constellations, and to all the powers of the heavens. The king removed the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple and took it outside Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley, where he burned it. Then he ground the ashes of the pole to dust and threw the dust over the graves of the people. Verse 8. Josiah brought to Jerusalem all the priests who were living in, the, in other towns of Judah. He also defiled the pagan shrines where they had offered sacrifices, all the way from Geba to Beersheba. He destroyed the shrines at the entrance to the gate of Joshua, the governor of Jerusalem. This gate was located to the left of the city gate as one enters the city. The priests who had served at the pagan shrines were not allowed to serve at the Lord's altar in, in Jerusalem, but they were allowed to eat unleavened bread with the other priests. Then the king defiled the altar of Topheth in the valley of ben Hanam, so no one could ever use it again. Uh, and uh, for very detestable practice, you can read about right, right after it. That was one of the big deals. It was one of the big things that God uh, was very upset with. Verse 11. He removed from the entrance of the Lord's temple the horse statues that the former kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. They were near the quarters of Nathan Melech the eunuch, an officer of the court. The king also burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. Josiah tore down the altars that the kings of Judah had built on the palace roof above the upper room of Ahaz. It's just amazing all the junk that they were using for idol worship everywhere, all over the place. It's just everywhere. And he's just doing away with all of it. He's completely purifying the land. It's awesome. The king destroyed the altars that Manasseh had built in the two courtyards of the Lord's temple. He smashed them to bits and scattered the pieces in the Kidron Valley. The king also desecrated the pagan shrines east of Jerusalem to the south of the Mount of Corruption, where King Solomon of Israel had built shrines for Ashtoreth, the detestable goddess of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the detestable god of the Moabites, and for Molech, the vile god of the Ammonites. This is stuff that even all, dated all the way back to the reign of King Solomon. He's just doing away with all of it. Verse 14, he smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. Then he desecrated these places by scattering human bones over them. And, you know, you don't see that instruction in the... In, uh, I don't see it. I mean, maybe I've missed it, but I don't see that in, in uh, anywhere in the rest of the Old Testament. Apparently, this is something that they knew about the the people who worship these gods, that if you were to do that, that it defiled those altars for use, they wouldn't use them for that anymore. And so he's just nullifying what they're doing, apparently, according to their own customs, is what it looks like. Verse 15, the king also tore down the altar at Bethel the pagan shrine that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had made when he caused Israel to sin. So now, he didn't just stop in the southern kingdom of Jerusalem. Now he's gone into the northern kingdom, what's left of it, and he's doing away with all that stuff up there too. He's just going above and beyond. So verse 15 again, The king also tore down the altar of Bethel, the pagan shrine that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had made, Israel, uh, had made when he caused Israel to sin. He burned down the shrine and ground it to dust, and he burned the Asherah pole. Then Josiah turned around and noticed several tombs in the side of the hill. He ordered the bones to be brought out, and he burned them on the altar at Bethel to desecrate it. This happened just as the Lord had promised through the man of God when Jeroboam stood beside the altar at the festival. Then Josiah turned and looked up at the tomb of the man of God who had predicted these things. So he just, he just unknowingly fulfilled a prophecy. He had no idea. Uh, he fulfilled one of the prophecies that God had made. Verse 17, What is that monument over there? Josiah asked. And the people of the town told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted the very things that you have just done to the altar at Bethel. Josiah replied, Leave it alone. Don't disturb his bones. So they did not burn his bones or those of the old prophet from Samaria. Then Josiah demolished all the buildings at the pagan shrines in the towns of Samaria, just as he had done at Bethel. They had been built by the various kings of Israel and made, and made the Lord very angry. He executed, he, or they, those things had made God angry. He's doing away with those things. Verse 20. He executed the priests of the pagan shrines on their own altars, and he burned human bones on the altars to desecrate them. Finally, he returned to Jerusalem. King Josiah then issued this order to all the people. You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. 
But in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Josiah also got rid of the mediums and psychics, the household gods, the idols, and every other kind of detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. He did this in obedience to the laws written in the scroll that Hilkiah the priest had found in the Lord's temple. Never before had there been a king like Josiah, who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses, and there has never been a king like him since. Even so, the Lord was very angry with Judah because of all the wicked things Manasseh had done to provoke, to provoke him. But the Lord said, I will also banish Judah from my presence, as I had, just as I had banished Israel. And I will reject my chosen city of Jerusalem and the temple where my name was to be honored. The rest of the events in Josiah's reign and all his deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. While Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. King Josiah and his army marched out to fight him, but King Necho killed him when they met at Megiddo. Josiah's officers took his body back in a chariot from Megiddo to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. Then the people of the land anointed Josiah Josiah's son Jehoahaz and made him the next king. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. Pharaoh Necho put Jehoahaz in prison at Riblah in the land of Hamath to prevent him from ruling in Jerusalem. He also demanded that Judah pay 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of gold as tribute. This goes to show how much the Treasury had dwindled. Verse 34, Pharaoh Necho then installed Eliakim, another of Josiah's sons, to reign in place after his father, in place of his father, excuse me, and he changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. Jehoahaz was taken to Egypt as a prisoner where he died. In order to get the silver and gold demanded as tribute by Pharaoh Necho, Jehoiakim collected a tax from the people of Judah, requiring them to pay in proportion to their wealth. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eleven years. His mother was Zabida, the daughter of Padiah from Ruma. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestors had done. So ends that great time of revival under King Josiah. Now let's uh, flip over to Jeremiah chapters 1 and 3. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 1. These are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. The Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. So this is during the reign of the last good king that we just read about. The Lord's messages continued throughout the reign of King Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, until the eleventh year of the reign of King Zedekiah, another of Josiah's sons. In August of that eleventh year, the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you, I'm too young. The Lord replied, Don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Now Jeremiah is just one man. How is he supposed to do that? By the word that God has spoken into his mouth, put into his mouth, that he speaks out in faith. It will come to pass on the earth, because God hastens to perform his word, it says. Verse 11, when the Lord, Then the Lord said to me, Look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I replied, I see a branch from an almond tree. And the Lord said, that's right. And it means that I am watching. So the word for almond tree sounds like the Hebrew word for watching. And it actually has it down here in the translation notes. Um, the, uh, the Hebrew word for watching, shoked, sounds like the word for almond tree, shoked. So he says, uh, so when he shows him the sign of the almond tree, he's like, that sign means that I'm watching. Behold, I'm watching. And I will certainly carry out all my plans. Verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to me again and asked, what do you see now? And I replied, I see a pot of boiling water spilling from the north. Yes, the Lord said, for terror from the north will boil out on the people of this land. Listen, I am calling the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem. I, the Lord, have spoken. 
They will set their thrones at the gates of the city. They will attack its walls and all the other towns of Judah. I will pronounce judgment on my people for all their evil, for deserting me and burning incense to other gods. Yes, they worship idols made with their own hands. Get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. For see, today I have made you strong like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, and people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail. For I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. It is interesting, you know, you see some parallels even in today's times where people, you know, they're, they're afraid to preach Jesus because of what people will think of them. And, well, what will they say? You know, they might, they might make fun of me. But if, if we are afraid of them, then, then they turn around and they're like, well, look, the Christians are weak, you know, and, and they live like we do. Why would we, why would we want what they have if they just live the same as we do? If there's no real change, if there's no real awesome working of God in their lives, then what's the point? You know, they want sincerity. They want truth. And uh, that requires boldness. Chapter 3. This is God speaking. If a man divorces a woman and she goes and marries someone else, he will not take her back again, for that would surely corrupt the land. But you have been unfaithful. So why are you trying to come back to me? This is God speaking to the people. Why are you trying to come back to me? Says the Lord. Look at the shrines at every hilltop. Is there any place you have not been defiled with other gods? You sit alone like a nomad in the desert. You have polluted the land with your unfaithfulness and your wickedness. That's why even the spring rains have failed. For you are brazen and completely shameless. I have things, you know, highlighted out because we're, we are, uh, we are uh, omitting a certain profession here. But of course, you, however you minister to whoever you're ministering to, be led by the Lord of how to do that. You have the word right in front of you. I'm not taking away anything from God's word. I'm just, I'm just, I don't know who's listening, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, keeping it mild. But yet, it's right before you. If you're following along with me, you can see it. Verse four. Yet you say to me, Father, you have been my guide since my youth. Surely you won't be angry forever. Surely you can forget about it. So you talk, but you keep on doing all the evil you can. What's God talking about? Hypocrisy, believing one thing and doing another. Verse six. During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, and this is, again, King Josiah was the good king we just read about. During his time, it was a great revival. During the, during the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, have you seen what fickle Israel has done? Israel has worshipped other gods on every, on every hill and under every green tree. I thought, after she has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her faithless sister Judah saw this. She saw that I divorced faithless Israel, but that treacherous sister Judah had no fear. And now she too has left me. Israel treated it all so lightly. She thought nothing of worshipping idols made of wood and stone. So now the land has been polluted. But despite all this, her faithless sister Judah has never sincerely returned to me. She has only pretended to be sorry. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then, so what's he talking about? It's during the reign of King Josiah. So the people didn't fully turn to the Lord. Josiah did. And he led them in the right way. And there were probably many who did follow his good example, but the majority of the people still, their hearts weren't loyal to God. That's what he's talking about here. Even though they saw the northern kingdom get carried away as captives, they still messed up. Verse 11, Then the Lord said to me, Even faithless Israel is less guilty than treacherous Judah. Therefore go and give this message to Israel. This is what the Lord says, O Israel, my faithless people, come home to me again, for I am merciful. I will not be angry with you forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. Admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God by worshiping idols under every green tree. Confess that you refused to listen to my voice. I, the Lord, have spoken. Return home, you wayward children, says the Lord, for I am your master. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, one from this town and two from that family, from wherever you are scattered. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. And when your land is once more filled with people, says the Lord, you will no longer wish for the good old days when you possessed the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. You will not miss those days or even remember them, and there will be no need to rebuild the Ark. In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations will come there to honor the Lord. 
they will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. In those days the people of Judah and Israel will return together from exile in the north. They will return to the land I gave your ancestors as an, inherit as an inheritance forever. I thought to myself, I would love to treat you as my own children. I wanted nothing more than to give you this beautiful land, the finest possession in the world. I looked forward to your calling me father, and I wanted you never to turn from me. But you have been unfaithful to me, you people of Israel. You have been like a faithless wife who leaves her husband. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 21. Voices are heard high on the windswept mountains, the weeping and pleading of Israel's people, for they have chosen crooked paths and have forgotten the Lord their God. My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me, and I will heal your wayward hearts. Yes, we're coming, the people reply, for you are the Lord our God. Our worship of idols on the hills are a delusion. Only in the Lord our God will Israel ever find salvation. From childhood we have watched as everything our ancestors worked for, their flocks and herds, their sons and daughters, was squandered on a delusion. Let us now lie down in shame and cover ourselves with dishonor, for we and our ancestors have sinned against the Lord our God. From our childhood to this day, we have never obeyed him. And so you see, it's important to, to, look, at, to look at this. If we had just read um, just what happened with the kings, we would never and, and, and did not see what God has written in the prophets. We would not have seen God's heart where he's like, come back to me. What I always wanted was to bless you and for you to call me father and for me to give you this wonderful land. It's what God's always wanted. And it's what God has restored to us in Jesus. Everything, Jesus is our redeemer. That's what that means. If people, you know, I, we used to sing about how our, I mean, as, when I was growing up as a kid in church, we would sing this song about our redeemer lives and never really knew what that means. But what he has done is he has redeemed all these things to us, those things which were lost. He has redeemed and restored those to us. That's why he said, whatever things you ask for, believe that you receive them when you pray and you'll have them, that your joy may be full. It's, it's because he wants us to have good things. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be prosperous for the sake of, or for the, the purpose of allowing us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven and turn to him and live. That's what he wants, is he wants life. He doesn't want death. So praise God. Lord, let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Uh, help us, Lord God, to see these things, to, as the word says in the Old Covenant, the Old, the Old Testament, that we may see your goodness in the land of the living. And it's all for your, the, it's all to drive forward the kingdom of God. It's all to uh, seek the kingdom of God. It's to seek your expanding kingdom in the earth, because every single person who accepts Jesus as Lord, that's one less person in the kingdom of darkness. And I thank you, God, for this awesome privilege that we have of being your ambassadors in the earth, Lord God. Help us to know your word better so that we can speak your word, not just speak your word, but also speak it the way you would speak it because we'll know you better for, for reading the word and for spending time in it and delighting in it and referencing it. And I thank you, Father God. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, bless you guys. And we will see you again.